I work for UNESCO, so I obviously have a big stake in this. One of UNESCO's functions under the S in UNESCO's name is precisely to promote ethics of science and technology in connection with education in order to promote social transformations for human benefits, in order to promote what the international community now calls the 2030 Agenda for Inclusive and Sustainable Development. So the questions that have been discussed here go to the heart of much of what UNESCO is supposed to be about. Previous speakers have said much that I could have said, which will save time, and I'll try to avoid repeating the excellent points made previously, which I strongly agree with. Let me try to not so much add some ideas, maybe I will add a couple, as to try to frame it in a way that corresponds to our institutional vision of how important these things are and what some of the key problems are. Um, as Maria was saying, science and technology are globalized, fact, irreversible fact. And within that globalized picture, Europe has a particular vision to put forward, which has many merits and also certain limitations. So what I'd like to talk about is basically in two parts. On the one hand, the challenges of actually globalizing the particular vision that the European Union has adopted, particularly because it has many relevant merits. And on the other hand, to talk about some of the limitations that might require sensitivity, not just in order effectively to globalize it, but also perhaps in order to improve it by global dialogue. There has sometimes been a tendency within um, EU policy communities to assume that the EU vision was perfect and that the only question was getting everyone else to sign up, against, sign up to it. Um, no, that won't work. It wouldn't work even if it was perfect because the principle of achieving global consensus by dialogue isn't just UNESCO's modus operandi. It's actually the only way you can achieve things in areas of soft law where no one has the capacity to impose global solutions. And in any case, the model probably isn't absolutely perfect anyway. In this globalized world, there are slippages and gaps which raise important questions for the viability of a responsible research and innovation framework. Among those gaps are different perspectives on the underlying values and principles, the ability uh, to evade controls, including in completely dishonest manner, what's known as ethical dumping in some of the literature, and uh, regulatory gaps that without necessarily creating dishonest behavior, nonetheless make it very difficult to monitor effectively whether people are actually following up on the values they're supposed to be committed to. With that in mind, what are the conditions that make this work reasonably well within the European Union, which perhaps on the whole can be expanded to most of the OECD area? First, because these countries share certain features, and secondly, because the OECD itself is an important mediator of international cooperation in this area. I think there are three to be kept in mind, each of which points us towards a specific problem. First of all, stable normative frameworks. Those exist through considerable effort over time within the European Union. They do not exist globally. Of course, we have normative instruments, some of which UNESCO is the guardian of. One example, the 2005 Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights, an important normative instrument adopted unanimously by all the member states of UNESCO, which lays down a series of general principles and some practical implications for how to handle key bioethics issues, not just in the area of uh, ethical concerns relating to biomedical technologies, but also more broadly in areas such as uh, gender, social responsibility, and environmental responsibility. Does the fact that all the member states of UNESCO signed up to the text mean that they all share the normative framework itself? No. One obvious problem, which should not be underestimated, and which constantly emerges within our global diplomatic discussions, Europeans' perspectives on bioethics are ultimately religious. And they are based on a specific form of religious outlook, which is effectively um, out of camp by Aristotle, to use horse breeding technology. In other words, it is a secularized form of Thomist um, scholasticism. The fact that it is secularized and has been for two centuries, 
means that there is sometimes a lack of sensitivity within the European Union, both its elites and its populations, to the extent to which there is a religious underpinning, which seen from the Confucian world or the Buddhist world simply does not make sense. For instance, the philosophical baggage of the term life is simply not the same in different cultural frameworks. This isn't about proposing to trash um, traditional European concerns about what many people, even in a secular context, would still call something like the sanctity or intrinsic value of life, particularly human life. But it is to recognize that you can't simply universalize it by pronouncing it, by declaring it. Similarly, there is um, a widespread perception, both in some parts of European public debate and in other parts of the world, that the European agenda is somehow anti-technology. Ultimately, if there is a choice between taking risks about new technologies and preserving existing situations, Europe will always err to the side of preservation, of prudence, of precaution, as the phrase goes, now entrenched in the legal frameworks of both the EU and its member states. That perception may not be correct, but it's a perception that drives global debate in these areas and leads particularly Asian countries to be unsure whether they would even want to start signing up to global frameworks driven by European concerns. So while the normative frameworks exist on paper, they're not fully shared or fully consensual, and their implications are potentially divisive. If you want a global RRI framework, you need at least some stabilization and some consensus of those normative, on those normative frameworks. Secondly, uh, the EU has the advantage of embedded institutional expectations built by a track record of practice, including both regulatory requirements and um, routine perceptions, training, uh, institutional codes, and other mechanisms that make ethics, and more generally RRI, not some heroic enterprise that involves um, individuals making dramatic commitments to the idea that they should be responsible for the future of humanity and the planet, but a more practical exercise of embedding that within institutional practice. That doesn't exist everywhere in the world, either because institutions are weak, because the processes are new, or because the frameworks within which um, the connection might be made between the high-level uh, normative principles and the routine institutional practices have not been developed. And finally, RRI, as Europe would wish to globalize it, is embedded in routine individual practices as well. Things work, these kinds of things work in part simply by becoming familiar, by being embedded in graduate training, um, other aspects of higher education, ongoing professional training, and so on. That doesn't necessarily exist everywhere. If you want to globalize it, then you need not just a reasonable degree of consensus about the normative frameworks, but also, most likely, routine institutional practice and routine individual practice as well. And that requires a form of engagement with uh, non-European science and technology, technology communities that is a bit different than simply preaching a particular standard to which others must comply. Now, money talks in this area. Of course it does. And the requirement that basically anyone getting money from uh, EU research and development programs has to sign up to EU standards in the area of uh, RRI, research ethics, and other related areas does have effects. But not everyone needs Europe's money anymore. And those who don't need Europe's money don't need to sign up to those standards unless they have other reasons to want to. And the challenge is, is precisely creating the other reasons. And then there are some limitations of the framework that I think deserve to be kept in mind, a number of which have already been mentioned by the two previous speakers. We shouldn't assume that the only challenge, as I mentioned in starting, is getting everyone else to sign up. There needs also to be some critical reflection on what might be the possible limitations of the framework that the European Union has um, developed over time. And this is one of the things that makes the global debate not just a challenge, but also a real opportunity to improve, enhance, refine the uh, frameworks that we have to hand. 
Broadly speaking, the current perspective has been driven by the desire to prevent abuse, I think we can say in general terms. It has been, in other words, um, a negative protective framework primarily. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that because in many areas the abuses, whether we're talking about abuse of human subjects or failure to pay attention to the need to avoid abuse of human subjects in biomedical research, but not only biomedical research. A parenthesis, I work in UNESCO's sector for social and human sciences, so we're sensitive to broader science issues, but I also have a particular agenda. Do we pay enough attention to possible abuse of human subjects in social and human science research? I don't think we do. How many sociologists or anthropologists really take seriously the question of human subjects and their rights within their work? Many traditional forms of anthropological and sociological research actually depend on the absence of informed consent. Otherwise, you couldn't do the research at all. Now, no, seriously. What's at stake is maybe less huge than um, in the case of biomedical research, but it's not trivial either. The reputation of a local community or an ethnic group or a voluntary association could be at stake, including the self-regard of its members uh, in the results of sociological and anthropological research conducted by various forms of participatory techniques that involve effectively pretending to be one of the group for the purposes of writing about it. This is time-honored. Is it acceptable? If it was in the biomedical area, the answer would be definitely no. We probably need a parallel debate in the social and human sciences about some of these implications. Um, second kind of abuse, the lack of social engagement, which has been extensively discussed. Rajesh in particular referred to this um, because it's the core of, uh, of his business, and it's very important. Um, it is not for scientists and policymakers to, to decide what a community should want. There needs to be a dialogue about what communities actually want. There are many very famous examples. The, one of the most famous from the development literature which I'll tell you, even though it takes a little bit of time because it's a nice anecdote, is the story of how um, a bunch of development specialists um, came to an African village in a, in a semi-arid region and discovered to their horror that the women of the community were spending three hours a day fetching water, which is a fairly common finding from many um, uh, rural African areas. And this was obviously horrible because it was incompatible with gender equality. Um, and so if women are spending three hours a day fetching water, what do they need? They need a pipe, and they need a pump, and they need a tap. So let's give them all of this. We don't ask them, we just give them, because it's obvious, right? Would you want to spend three hours a day fetching water? So they install the uh, water delivery facility at great expense and inaugurate it with a nice shiny ribbon and, all, and the head, local head of UNDP uh, cuts the ribbon and so on, and everyone's very happy. And when they do the follow-up visit um, a year later, the pipe is, the tap, pipe, the whole infrastructure is rusting and unused. And the women are very unhappy. Why? And then someone thinks to ask an anthropologist to find out why the women are unhappy. This is a true story. Um, and just a few days of interviews reveals the fact that while the women weren't happy per se in spending three hours a day fetching water, they explained to the anthropologist, because no one had asked them previously, that it was the only time they had away from the home. It was the only chance they had to spend time among women without the burden of children and husbands. They actually valued that time, even though carrying the water was a burden. By depriving them of that time, the engineers and development specialists had actually messed up their daily routine. Now, fortunately, they were able to keep the daily routine simply by ignoring the tap. <laughs> Does that count as abuse? Maybe not. It certainly counts as gross inefficiency. Um, third kind of abuse, corporate control, which has already, already been referred to. On the issue of vaccination, this, exactly the public debate you described took place in France as well, with exactly the same consequences. And the key word is the one you said, Merck. Is it surprising that people don't trust pharmaceutical companies to tell us that their product is safe? 
That's a problem which is sometimes exaggerated to the point of hysteria, but is a real problem at the same time. If the only people who can confirm the safety of a product are the people who manufacture it, then inevitably concern about the possible abuses is very present. So preventing abuse is very important. And it's not a criticism of the established RRI framework to emphasize the fact that it was designed primarily for that and has many benefits in delivering precisely that. But at the same time, there needs to be a slightly broader perspective, which again, both previous speakers have referred to. In, at its most general level, the challenge is to deliver on Article 27, Paragraph 2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which all of you know by heart, right? Yeah, I don't even need to repeat it. <laughs> Article 27, paragraph 2 states the human right freely to share in the benefits of um, uh, scientific uh, progress and its applications. And I don't think I even got that word perfect. Um, ensuring responsible research and innovation as conventionally understood ensures the absence of abuses, it does not ensure the universal, the realization of the universal human right to share in the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. Because for that, you would need to build in a number of other concerns on top of the anti-abuse agenda. Um, the question of agendas and how they get shaped is hugely important in this regard. Again, it was discussed, and I, I don't need to repeat it. Um, one needs to add to the RRI perspective a framework for deciding what should be a priority, particularly in the face of scarce resources, that is not always built into it. Similarly, one would need to question open access at several other levels than the ones already discussed. In some ways, the most problematic um, aspect of open access is that it actually imposes a purely consumer approach to science on scientists in developing countries. Because open access means publication fees, which developing country scientists can't pay. So they can read everything, but they can write nothing. And how can you be a scientist if you can't publish? To be a scientist is not to be able to read scientific literature. It's to be able to participate in it. And open access does not produce that. In fact, as conventionally applied, it goes in precisely the opposite direction. Think about the implications. Think also about the consequences, and this is main, possibly mainly for the social and human sciences, less significant for the physical and life sciences, the implications of open access for linguistic diversity in science. Open access in practice, with some important exceptions, means English-only science. What are the consequences of that? An important exception being Latin America. And the third point I wanted to mention, and I'll close with that, is the question of technology choice. <coughs> Particularly in the social and human sciences, thanks to the excellent work of my colleagues in Claxo, whom I take the opportunity to salute. Um, the question of technology choice tends to be supplier driven. We assume that the best way to meet the needs of the developing world is to give them access to cutting edge technologies. Is that always the best option? Not for us to say. This comes back to the question of social engagement. But in order to have a responsible research and innovation framework that takes account of the full range of issues around technology choices and when perhaps non-cutting edge choices are the best for a particular situation, goes considerably, considerably beyond the avoidance of abuse framework and requires us to broaden things a bit. So globalizing an RRI perspective is about achieving also that broadening and that pluralizing of the RRI framework, again, through dialogue with the perspective of achieving a reasonable practical consensus among a very diverse group of stakeholders. Thank you.